Pat, you are live. Welcome everybody. Hello and greeting. I am Pat. I will be your underwater biologist today. We have my man Rian on camera and my girl Lauren up on the surface. So today I am at Casuarina Point on the western side of Grand Cayman Island. Now I am pretty shallow at the moment. It's a very overcast day. And so to get the most of the light, we're gonna stay pretty shallow and head out to this edge of this reef and just go along the edge and see what we can find between the hard pan, which is this, this ecosystem here, and the coral reef. So we'll be on the edge of both to see what we can find. Now, if you have any questions, please send them in. If you're on Twitter, use the hashtag DiveLive. And if you're on YouTube or Facebook, there's no need to, because we'll see it anyway. So, let Lauren say hello, and I'll head on out, see what I can find. Let's go diving. Thank you, Pat. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another early morning dive. Now, the weather here is slightly different today in Grand Cayman. As Pat mentioned, it's overcast and a bit rainy, so I am really excited about doing a shallow dive. Now, Pat, can I put in my requests? Yes. I would like to see some flamingo tongues and possibly even a flounder. Yeah, oh, a flounder would be great. I'll definitely keep my eyes out for one of those. So the shallow ecosystem is completely different, so it will be a different dive today, but it's beautiful nonetheless. So we're making it a little bit different for you today. And I see we're looking at some very small fish. Yes, yeah, very <laughs> little ones here. So we have a juvenile four-eyed butterfly fish. Now, I've never oh. seen one in their juvenile phase. We can see that they still have those black horizontal vertical body bars running down there. But we can see that it's got that eye starting, well, that false eye starting to develop between the rear of its body. Well, it must start be be starting to go into the intermediate phase because it's actually already lost that second false eye. So normally when they're juvenile juvenile they will have two of those black dots on either side. That is so cute. It is. This is about an inch. So just over two centimeters long. It's tiny. So I can imagine it's two fully juvenile phase must be minuscule. Well, uh, we do have some requests for juvenile fish, so love dogs would love to see more of the juvenile fish that we sort of regularly talk about the adult forms, so maybe it could be a juvenile fish dive. Yeah, yeah, definitely, why not? While well, we are in the shallows, Let, let's do that. But, Lauren, I have found what you wanted, and I believe I was speaking to Sophie last night, and she also wanted one of these. It is a flamingo tongue, Ooh. and this one is on the move. So it's on the move. And it's actually, for once, not on a Gorgonian. I've actually never seen one not on its favourite fruit, the Gorgonian. How exciting! I asked, and Pat delivered. So happy 4th of July to everyone who is celebrating and right ahead of us we have a beautiful flamingo tongue. Look at that. So Pat, can you give us a size estimate before we talk about what a flamingo tongue is? Yeah, so this one is about four, five, maybe six centimeters long, so a little over three inches. And can you see it's little slapping coming out there? Yeah, we can, we can. Awesome. So a flamingo tongue is a gastropod, and a gastropod is a sea snail, or any sort of snail really. They are related to the land snails, although living a different lifestyle. So this guy, although it may look like it has a spotted shell, those spots aren't actually on its shell. What they are is an extension of their mantle. Now the mantle is the layer of tissue that actually secretes the shell. So they can extend this over the top and it serves as a warning to back off because they are poisonous. 
And now the reason they're poisonous is because they eat Gorgonians. And Gorgonians have a toxin in them that these flamingo tongues can accumulate and use as their own defense, which is absolutely fascinating. It really is, and Joe Chan commented that it looks like a really posh chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I do actually kind of see that. <laughs> so they are very often found in male and female pairs. They do have separate sexes, so obviously this one is alone, and we can really see it moving. Great work, Leanne. Yeah, this is the first time I've actually ever seen one on the move. Usually they're just sitting there by them, or in groups or by themselves on a Gorgonian. Just like this one here on this sea fan. Yeah, just up here, Rian. So we'll just show everyone the one. You got another one? Sitting. And we can see that there is a bit of a black patch around it. And that is because it has eaten away the Gorgonian right down to its actual axial skeleton. So that's its kind of internal structures. So that's why there's black around that flamingo tongue there. Yeah, so that's two flamingo tongues we've got. And as Pat mentioned, the populations have declined in recent years because some divers and snorkelers do think that that is the colour of the shell, as Pat mentioned. So they would assume that it's a brightly colourful shell and they will start to collect it. But it won't be till they maybe get home that they realise it is the animal itself that is producing this pattern, not the shell. The shells are completely white. Yes, if I do come across one with their mantle retracted and a pure white shell, I will point it out. Yeah, that would be awesome to see a whole variety of flamingo tongues today. I really do love them. So, that one that we saw moving about, they achieve movement by their foot. Now, their foot is a big muscular structure that takes up most of the base of their, their, their soft tissue and they use this as kind of a suction to move along if you can imagine how a slug would move along the ground, this is essentially how these gastropods move about. Pat, we do have a question from Proud Cat Mama. Can you explain flamingo tongue reproduction? Reproduction? Well, that is something I do not know a lot about. I believe that they are broadcast spawners, and I'm not sure whether they lay eggs attached, or, or, or no, I do believe that they lay their eggs on the Gorgonians that they settle on, and the eggs get fertilised. Yeah, I do believe that is correct. I think the females can lay several egg masses within a cycle, and they, they lay them on the Gorgonians themselves. And then the eggs will develop into larvae, planktonic larvae. I can't believe how we're actually seeing this one moving. It's it's great. It's great to watch. Yeah, it is. Always good to get uh, a different behaviour out of a species that we do see a little bit. So now I've got one off my list. You'll need to find a flounder. Flounder, yes. I will definitely be searching around for one of those. Although it may be difficult to spot because they can camouflage very well. But this is the habitat to find them. The only place I've seen them here in Grand Cayman is on this hard pan habitat. Yes, the, what we call the hard pan is really what you're looking at right now. And this is full of the little critters, the camouflage animals, and the small juveniles, and even just really, really small animals. So it's a great place to take your time and really have a look inside. Oh, nice. I found a very cool little blenny right here. So I'll move the other young way. It's very small, but hopefully we can get a good look at it. Okay, I've got the ID book ready. I'm not the best with blennies, but I am working on it. 
Now, we did actually get asked a question before um, about how we tell the difference between Glennies and Gobies. Well, actually, you can. Now, they are very, very similar but they can easily be distinguished by their dorsal fin. Now their dorsal fin is that one on the top because gobies will have two dorsal fins when you're looking at them and blennies will just have one long continuous one apart from one species which is called the triple fin and that obviously hence the name has three. But generally um, gobies have two and blennies have one. Even the way they position themselves is different. So gobies have a tendency to sort of rest with a stiff, straight body, whereas blennies will perch in a more relaxed fashion, which is slightly curved. So they're, oh, I can see it now. Look at that. All right, this is a bit tricky, but I'm on it, Pat. Are you close enough to be able to describe it? Oh, I know that it's a mottled green colour, almost like army camouflage, mm -hmm. and it has little red eyes. And you think it's definitely a blenny, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, one hilarious thing that blennies do is that they can move their eyes independently. If you've ever seen any still photos of a blenny, You'll know why I find it so funny because <laughs> they just look, <laughs> they look very silly with their eyes darting off in different directions. Almost like they're pulling a deliberate silly face at you. Are we able to get any closer? I understand they sort of are a bit skittish and might hide, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to ID it just from the head. Okay, we've got a slightly better view now. Bear with me, Pat. I'm just having a look. It could be a number of blennies. Would you say that it's got bars running down its body? Uh, let me just try and get another look at it. Mm, it's a little bit difficult, I can only see the head. Mm, I would know. Oh. Uh, no, I would describe its body pattern as mottled or patchy or... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's not really spotty, but there's just patches of brown and patches of white. Okay. I'm not sure I can do a positive ID from this angle, That's but it okay. definitely is a blenny. Blennies are notoriously difficult to identify, and it's made even harder by the fact that Lauren is watching on a screen and this guy is tiny, so the part that we can see sticking out is only about an inch or maybe two inches. So it's oh, is he coming out? Oh, we just saw him eating something. That was cool. <laughs> They are magnificent little creatures. Now they do tend to live in habitats like this where there's a little opening or a burrow that they can sit up using their pectoral fins like we're seeing now and observe the world around them. So sometimes you can even find them in the little paws of a sponge living away there. Okay, so we've got some questions here. Proud Cat Mama is asking, are Blennies territorial, Pat? Well, they, as I just said, they do have their little homes like this. Now, I have not heard of them being aggressive in defending their territory, but they do tend to stick to their one spot. Yeah, that's correct. And John has suggested an arrow blenny. It's definitely not an arrow blenny. We do see them regularly on Dive Live. And to answer Love Dog's question, we do believe the fish from yesterday was a tobacco fish. Well done. I almost said that yesterday, but I didn't. And it was a tobacco fish. So that is a new one for our species list. Yeah. yeah. Well remembered. Our ever-growing species list. So. Lauren and I are trying to add at least one species per dive. So, 
John is suggesting if it's green, it's a spiny head. But I'm not sure if I can confirm that it's green from here. Would you say green, Pat? Ah, uh, yeah. It definitely has a green hue to it. But I would say it's predominantly brown. Yeah, there is a chance it could be a pearl blenny. I have got some blennies here that it definitely could be. So Pat, that's our job for tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We will definitely look at that one. But it's nice just to get a blenny here on Dive Live as well. Yeah, nice and walk. as Pat mentioned, these guys are so, so, so small. So that was great camera work, Rian. What are you hoping to see, Pat? Well, I was actually really hoping to show everyone a blenny today. That's one of the reasons I did start on the hard hit. So I picked that off my list. And, well, I really, I know we always say this, but a turtle. We haven't had a turtle for almost a week now. And I haven't been running the water for quite some time myself. So I'd really love to a little visit from a turtle. Me too, I would really love that. Um, John says he has no idea, he's a bit stumped and so are we. We're getting lots of suggestions about that Blenny. And Love Dogs is right, they do all look very sim similar. I am sitting with the ID book here. So I'll look up some of your suggestions and see if we can match it. Oh, we found it! <gasps> no Perfect. way! Perfect! So this is a peacock flounder. Awesome! Amazing! You got both of my wishes! <laughs> We've got you back, Lauren. This is great! I'm going to come to you anytime with all my problems now, <laughs> Pat. <laughs> Now what we have in front of us is a peacock flounder, very camouflaged, but you can definitely see it there. And what an obscure animal this is. <laughs> it's, whole, it's whole morphology and body form is just very, very different to what we're used to seeing with fish. Now the interesting thing about these flounders <laughs> is that when they're juveniles, they actually just look like normal fish. And as they mature, their eyes start to come to the side of their body and it all flattens out and they end up with this very odd shaped body that we see here. Yeah, the eyes actually do a migration. One eye, once you reach a certain age, migrates to the other side of the fish's head. So as Pat mentioned, it is born a normal-ish looking fish, and then it ends up looking like what we have in front of us. So, these flounders, as we have mentioned, are very good at camouflage. Now, they are so good that they have done experiments where they have put them over a chessboard and their body colour went the, the black and white variation of what that chessboard looked like. So they're very in tune to what they're camouflaging into. Yeah, that's an amazing experiment. They can actually change to their background so you can see right now we can see really clearly that pattern on its body and how well it blends in with the sand if it's not really swimming there's a chance that you could actually swim over this fish and completely miss it so what size would you say it is Ooh, i would say it is a bear from tail to its nose probably 30 centimeters so a ruler length or 12 inches. But it's also quite fat. I would say it's about 20 centimetres across as well. So just under 10 inches, about 8 inches across. 
They actually can get bigger than that. The flounders can reach around 25 inches in length and generally the females are larger than the males in this species. So you can see its gill flapping. So just to the right of its eye, you can see the gill pumping up and down. And they can change their color. Pat already mentioned the experiment with the chessboard. They can change it in two to eight seconds. So they're really fast and absolute masters of the art of camouflage. So Betty was asking, is it actually swimming on its side? Well, <laughs> that's a bit hard to, <laughs> hard to say. I mean, it's, it's on its stomach, I guess you could say, but then also at the same time, if it was a normal fish, or if speaking of normal fish, then technically it would be on its side. But the eye does migrate around the body, so I guess, yeah, it kind of is on its side. Yeah, I guess so, I guess so. <laughs> You could get away with saying either, I think. Either its side or its belly. And they are a nocturnal animal, so they're much more active during the night, which is why they are so hard to spot during the day. And we can kind of already guess just by looking at this animal's body shape and, and the fact that it camouflages so well, as Rihanna's shown us right now, that they are an ambush predator. So you can imagine it just lying there completely motionless and waiting for its prey to come by and then it will just spurt up and grab it in the blink of an eye. So you can already guess that just by looking at this animal that that's how it would get its prey. Everybody's so like interested and amazed by this fish, Pat. Well oh, spotted. Well, uh, oh, we have shown these on dive live before, but that was one of the very, very first dives. That was actually when Graham was under the water. So that's how long ago the last time we saw one of these peacock flounders was. Yeah, a very long time ago. So I have been waiting to see another one, and now we have it. Now, we have spoken about their colour change and how they actually do that is by specialised cells called chromatophores. Chromatophores are cells that contain pigments that can reflect light differently depending on their orientation. And so when its orientation is changed, then so does the colour. And that is why these fish can change colour so quickly. Yeah, and there's been a lot of experiments into fish changing colour and it's not quite the same as octopus and squid. They do believe that a lot of fish can change their colour by the actual skin cells themselves re reacting to the light. So if it gets darker above where there's less light, they will change and if it gets lighter, they will change. It's different cells to what is in the eye. So they do believe that a lot of these fish can actually see light, if you like, using these chromatophores. The weird and wonderful of the, of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. I was just about to say it is crazy down here. It's unfathomable, you know. Can't even imagine how I feel changing colours or... What the response or how I would even control that? It's a, it's a lot to wrap your head around. So Pat, we have a question from Christina. Are there gills on both sides? Are we able to sort of get a front-on look at this little flounder? Yeah, so we can see here that the gill on the top side working away and on the underside, can you see the underside there? Um, no, we can just see one gill pumping. Oh, oh yes, we can. We can. Yeah, yeah. So nice. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's the visual answer to your question.
This is such a great view. We could stay on this flounder forever. <laughs> they are very wonderful, weird and wonderful. The definition of weird and wonderful. And if we can just go to, oh, we see it moving in that lovely undulating fashion. Um, if we can just go to the head again without without scaring it, we're going to try and point out the mouth. A few people are asking where is the mouth. Joe Chan is asking if it's maybe not underneath. And no, it's not really. So once Rian gets round to the head, we're going to zoom in and you can see that the mouth is right at the tip or the top of the animal and it extends on both sides if you like so a little bit difficult to explain but let's see if we can get the camera to show us it should be right underneath that eye and Lara Moore is asking what happens if the fish lands half and half on two different color surfaces <laughs> Well, if we're going off the experiment that I referred to earlier, then we could assume that it would change half and half. But I don't know that for sure. No, I think you're correct, Pat. It would half and half. Now, we just had a great shot of the mouth. It's turned a little bit away from us, but you were able to see the mouth there, right on the tip of the animal. So this is a peacock flounder. It's just incredible to to watch. And we can see that its whole body has been modified from the normal species, but it still has that distinct anatomy of a fish. The dorsal and ventral fins have been modified to run the entire way around the body to make it move almost not like a stingray, but it has that same kind of uh, rounded shape that it uses to... Well, this one doesn't fly, it doesn't flap wings, it, it kind of undulates down the body. But it's completely modified its body plan to suit its life. And the pectoral fin, although we can't really see it right now, it is still present and it, in some species of flounder, it is quite large and flamboyant and can be used for mating and for uh, displays of dominance. Yeah, so just to interrupt there, we're getting a perfect shot of the mouth. So right under that right eye, as we're looking at it, you can see that small little opening in a curved shape. That is the mouth. So Tom was asking about the eyes, and yet we already mentioned it, but it does start off a completely normal fish as a juvenile, a typical fish with eyes on both sides. It isn't until it grows and becomes a little bit older that one of the eye, eyes will migrate to the other side of the body. This fish also does not have a swim bladder. It does lose this as it grows. So it undergoes a complete transformation from juvenile into adult. Yeah, just to highlight how well camouflaged this animal is, despite Rian having the camera directly on it, I still struggle to find it. It takes me a good 10 seconds of looking around just to see where it is again once I've taken my eyes off it. So they really do blend into this hard pan environment quite well. So just to add on what Pat said, how it works underwater, the, the underwater biologist normally just stays a little bit back, allowing the cameraman to get a perfect view for us all. And Rianne will be far away from this animal. The power of the zoom has allowed us to stay far away and we can zoom right in. Normally this animal is very scared. The minute you swim up to it, it will just swim away. So the fact that we're able to get so close is the power of the zoom. So Pat, we have a question from Christina again. Why is it called the peacock flounder? 
well, the flounder part comes from the fact that all of these flat fishes are called flounders. And the peacock part comes from the blue rings all over its body, so they're kind of like a, a display of pizzazz, if you will, a bit peacockish. So that is where they get their name from. Yes, it's very flamboyant, that blue turquoise colour that you can see. Now, proud cat mama is asking about how many species of flounders there are. I'm not sure about in the world, but I can tell you here in the Caribbean, we have approximately about eight species of flounder. But they are grouped together with souls. They're very closely related to souls, which we also have here. But there's about eight species of flounder in the Caribbean. Now, Richard is asking a great question, and I, I'm not 100% sure of the answer, Pat, but I'll put it to you. Um, is it always the same eye that migrates, or do they go both ways? Ooh, that is a good question. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, I do not know the answer to that. But if I have to guess, I would assume it is controlled genetically, and therefore it's the same eye. Uh, passed down from generation to generation, but I do not know that for sure. That is just my guess. Yes, I do believe it is the same eye. Like Pat mentioned, it is co controlled by genetics, and I do believe it is a hormone regulated process, so therefore I do think it is the same eye. But that's an awesome question. Yeah. You always have the best questions, Richard. <laughs> Yes, we like being quick to test. Oh, can you see it's moving that pectoral pin up? Yes, we can now. So just behind the eyes, if you like, just now we were able to see the pectoral fin. So it does still have the same anatomy as a normal fish as Pat previously described. And John has said it's always the left eye. Ah, okay. So interesting. Thank you, John. They are preyed on by sharks. Um, I believe stingrays do, the bigger, much bigger stingrays do tend to um, eat them as well. And eels, moray eels can eat them and they are a delicacy for humans. So humans will be the main predator as always. And we can't see this right now, but this flounder is actually able to use those undulating fins to bury itself in the sand. And we can really only see the two eyes sticking out. So not only is it camouflage on the hard pan that we can see right now, they can actually bury themselves in the sand. They are carnivores. Um, Love Dogs was asking what they eat. And they do eat fish, shrimps, and crabs. They are carnivores. Well, um, I think I've just about exhausted all of my information on these with creatures. <laughs> Me too. Do we have any more questions? Um, I am just checking. But even if you want to swim, we can still always go back to the flounder. Yes, well, there is a big school of tarpon right here. Oh, nice. Just floating about. Now, this is odd to see them here in the shallows during the day. Yeah. So they are nocturnal feeders. And generally, during the, they will be active during the night time. But during the day... They tend to hang out just like they are now, very still, very silent, and very, very chilled out. But they'll do this at a place where there's a lot of rocky ledges and caves and places that they can really hide away. So to see them just chilling out here in the shallows is a bit peculiar. Well, can you give us the depth so it puts it into context and how deep you actually are at the minute? Yeah, sure. So. I'm at three metres, <laughs> about 10 feet down, and probably only about 50 metres offshore, so just over 150 feet, so not very far out at all, and 
These are very big fish to be in such a shallow niche or habitat. And just before you tell us all about these tarpons, can we have a quick air check? I'm sure you have a lot of air because you're very shallow, but let's have an air check. Yes, so... I am on 140 bar. Mmm, nice! So still plenty of time down here. So, these tarpons... These actually look a bit smaller than the ones that we usually see around here. They're still very large by any one's standard. But oh, I'd say the biggest one here is about a metre twenty. So just about four feet. And the smallest one is about oh, 70 centimetres. So that is just over two feet long. They do look very big from where I'm looking and it's so interesting how they're just hanging in the water column there. They barely look like they're moving. Yeah, they are very relaxed right now. Probably just winding down after a nice out of hunting. <laughs> now one of my favourite facts about tarpons is the fact that they are air breathers. So, they obviously can still use their gills while they're underwater, but if they do need a little bit of extra energy provided from that fresh oxygen, they can go up to the surface and take a gulp of air. Now they have a swim bladder, which is an organ that all fish have to control their buoyancy, but this acts in tarpon as a pseudo lung which means that it is what they can use to actually bring the air in. Yeah, Pat's right, it's crazy. These ancient fish, and they are very ancient, they can breathe air. Now, Pat mentioned a swim bladder. So this is actually an organ. It's also called an air bladder that is used to control buoyancy in most of the bony fish. So we did just mention that the flounder doesn't have one, but these tarpons do, and this is what they use as a pseudo lung. So it's normally always filled with gas. Most of the time it's oxygen, and they're able to use this also as a lung. Isn't that crazy? No, I was just going to say I've done a lot of research and I do believe that the biggest ever tarpon caught weighed in at almost, not quite, but almost 300 pounds. So I think that would be around 140 kilograms. Yeah, yeah, it's a very big fish. Wow. But that doesn't surprise me. They are monsters and... Once they reach a really big size, they, well, the bigger they get, the less is going to predate on them. So once they reach a certain size, it's all, they could almost be you know, pretty sure that they're never going to be attacked by anything. So they just keep growing and growing. Yeah, and you kind of have to feel sorry for them. They're the classic victims of their own success because they've survived such a long time through evolution and some evidence actually suggests that they've been around for roughly 125 million years and they have rarely changed or changed their body shape very, very little and this is because they're so well designed and good at what they do. They can thrive in salt water, as you can see, but they can also thrive in fresh water and oxygen poor environments due to this unique swim bladder. Yeah, evolution really got it right with these guys. Well, Proud Cat Mama is asking for a tarpon's um, scientific name, and I hate to admit this to you all, but I have this weird thing about m just being able to remember lots of Latin names. I don't know why. So I can tell you this is Megalops Atlanticus. Now, the Atlanticus part is fairly obvious because it's found in the Atlantic Ocean. And Megalops sort of derives from the fact that Mega means really large and Lops means face. 
so I don't think I need to. Oh, there's the one with the fishing pad. Yeah, yeah, we have to point that out. Oh, yeah, we see this one regularly. Yeah, so unfortunately that rook still hasn't rusted out. But all in all, the animal does look in good condition. Obviously the line isn't snagged on anything, so it's just hanging it out of its mouth. So I think it's going to be okay. Yeah, this must be the same individual. It's probably actually the same school. Yeah, yeah. Most likely, or at least there's some sample of that school. So, we have a question from Jacqueline. Do people eat tarpon, Pat? Yes, they do. Now, they are not known for their eating, for their table qualities, but they are eating. They are targeted recreationally for fishing because look at the size of them. So, you know, big fish put up a big fight and that is what recreational fishermen chase. And we can tell that because of this one with the fishing line hanging out of its mouth. But they are generally released if they are caught, but some people do keep and eat them. Yeah, they are a completely prized sport fish tarpon. And believe it or not, they're actually the distant cousins of eels. Now, they really don't look it, but they are. And their larvae, their, their juveniles, actually look just like an eel larvae. Very flat, ribbon-like, almost. So it's amazing to think a tiny, flat, ribbon fish, only a couple of inches long, will actually grow into almost an eight-foot monster. Evolution is baffling. Now one thing reaches another. So I've just seen some uh, just over here. We have found a bit of squid ink. Oh, exciting so, stuff. So hopefully that means that whatever left this ink, the squid that left it, is hanging at a bear. So that's the ink there. It's black substance. And that is melanin, mostly, that it is made up of. And this is what squid will produce when they feel threatened and want to escape a, a predator. So that must mean that there are some squid hanging around in this area, so I'll be definitely looking out for them. Oh, please do. Please, I'd love to see some squid today. Now, squid ink can also, it's very similar to that of octopus, of course, and it does contain a sort of chemical called tyrosinase and this is actually found in humans uh, a natural chemical which controls the production of melanin so as Pat mentioned the ink is mainly made up of melanin but this tyrosinase actually can cause irritating blindness in predators that are trying to eat the squid or the octopus and not only blindness, because a lot of animals don't rely on their eyes, remember, it also garbles their sense of smell. So this gives the octopus or the squid enough time to get away. And the octopus is so potent that if the octopus itself doesn't get away in time, it can actually die from its own ink. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> Bit rough for the old octopus. Ooh, what's this? Everyone's hoping you find these squids. What, uh, I think I have found a brutal scar, it looks like. What was that, Pat? I think it is a brutal scar here. We might be able to get a better look with the zoom. So I saw these tentacles or arms coming out. Can you see that? Um, yes, we can now, just a little bit though. I think the arms have been pulled back inside. 
Are we able to get a little bit closer? That's okay, it was a bit of a difficult spot, but if I do see a better positioned one, I will point it there. Yes, please do. I'm loving this dive pack. Yeah, this is great. It's, uh, for a lot of the earlier dives, we did avoid this hard pan area a bit because we kind of thought of it as a bit of a marine desert, especially when we didn't have zoom because everything here is so small. But lately, the more time we've been spending here in the shallows, the more we've been enjoying it. It's just been a whole new world of species opened up for us, as we've seen from today's dive. So I'm going to stay around this area. It's been really, really enjoyable. So I just want to apologize. Um, Facebook isn't working as well, so we're, I was, wasn't really able to get your questions, but I can see a few coming through right now so I apologize about that Twitter and YouTube is working much better for us but Timothy is asking how's your air so let's just get another air check for you yep so one hundred and twenty bars left there's still plenty of time down here now I am shallower and because I'm shallower there is less pressure and because there is less pressure I am using my air a lot less. And I've just saw the comment from Patty saying zombie fish. I assume you're referring to the flounder and that's a great meme. We might adopt that. <laughs> So sorry, we are having a lot of trouble with Facebook these days. We can just... Oh, we can see a squirrel fish, Pat. Everybody loves a squirrel fish. Yeah, yeah. The big eyes there. Now, usually when we see squirrel fish on the reef, we think of them as small fish in comparison to everything. But here, hanging around all of these juvenile fish, it actually looks quite large. But it is only about 15 centimetres long, so about 7 inches. Yeah, and they have that big nocturnal eye and a really cute mouth. They face us um, head on a lot like it's doing now. So you get to see the whole facial expression there and it, it does make me laugh when I'm diving underwater. <laughs> Now, Pat, tell us why they're called squirrel fish. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but they do make a noise just like a squirrel, or sorry, I have heard. Now, I've never actually heard them produce this noise, but it does not surprise me. Fish are actually a lot more vocal than what we give them credit for. Yeah, and just to sort of back up what Pat said, they, a lot of fish use their swim bladder, or their air bladder, whatever you want to call it, to actually resonate sound. So a lot of sounds that are produced from fish, which can come in a huge range from wailing, grunting, moaning, screeching, squeaking, squirrel sounds, whatever they are, can be produced from vibrating muscles against the swim bladder. So it has a double function, if you like. Now, a lot of people, I know for sure, um, Ravinder and Sophie seem to love these squirrel fish, so this is for you guys. Yes, we love providing the goods, and I've already found everything Lauren wanted to see today, so it's all up to whatever you guys want to see. Okay, next is a mola mola and a whale shark pack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll find a unicorn while I'm at it. <laughs> And the Jersey lady has said it's really fun being able to name things and identify things with us. And I agree, you're part of this journey. Me and Pat do not know all of the fish, but we are getting better. So Pat, if you see any other fish that's maybe fully out, let, let's try and identify it for everyone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, there's quite a few weird little species amongst here. It's almost like these bits here are mini coral reefs because we are on the edge of the reef and so there are these miniature bombings everywhere that have all of these little juvenile fish so it's just like a very shrunken down part of the reef. 
and Betsy B was saying the eyes are incredible and yes they are and it does tell us straight away without having to do any research that they are nocturnal. Now I have found a little uh, yeah no it's still around so a hamlet just oh, here. Yes. Now I believe this is a barred hamlet but it may also be a ivory because it is quite a lot yellower than some of the bar hamlets I have seen. Okay, let's take a look and while we're looking Lara Moore wants a mermaid. Now, I'm sorry, Lara, I'm not underwater today, so you won't get the mermaid. <laughs> yeah, just watch any one of Lauren's live dives and then you'll see a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> now, just for everyone's information, I am suffering from a bit of an ear infection, so a huge big shout out to Pat for always covering my back, always supporting me. I might not be in the water for a few days, but I will be here on the surface. So it's all the more diving for me. Oh, Pat, this is interesting. This, hmm. It doesn't look like the usual barred hamlet, does it? No. Could it be the butter hamlet? No, it's definitely not the butter. Okay. I saw that the other day just as we stopped broadcasting. I wasn't able to share it with you. Hmm. Now, I, the only, oh, the rock beauty there giving us a little show. The only fish that it, it really could be is the barred hamlet, but it's very differently coloured from the, the, the proper adult barred hamlet. So, Pat mentioned it could be a hybrid because this particular family of fish do produce hybrids, or it's maybe a little bit younger, maybe it's a juvenile, what do you think? Well, it looks fully grown. I, I haven't seen many hamlets bigger than this one. It looks full size to me. So that, I, I reckon this one is a hybrid. Mm. They do have so many different hybrid variations. And yeah, the fact that this one has like blue uh, dorsal, I mean ventral fins as well, makes me think it could even be a hybrid between a barge and a butter. But I have found another new species. Oh, you're on fire. So we have a soak fish here. We haven't shown one of these before on Dive Live. Yay, we were just talking about them. Okay, another new species. So these soak fishes get their name from the fact that if you were to handle one to rub your, your hand along it, that they actually have a very soap-like substance that they secrete the mucus that they secrete and it's just like soap. We can see it here using its flexible, malleable body to get in and feed in that little hole there. Me and Pat were actually just talking about this fish. We do have sometimes normal conversations, but we, we talk about fish a lot and this is actually the greater soap fish. I particularly think it's a very ugly looking fish and it does swim in such a strange manner. We really only see this fish in the shallows. Yeah, they, they, they're almost like a flattened eel or something like that. They have very flexible, malleable bodies and we can see that they tend to swim on their side a lot as well because they are a bit flattened, so... Yeah, they are very eel-looking. Um, they're solitary. You won't find more than one saltfish together in, in sort of one territory. And they're inactive during the day. <laughs> so this one, it is uh, trying to hide itself. It's not doing a very good job. Oh, well, maybe it is. You can see it pushing itself in that hole there because it's trying to hide. It's trying to rest on its side, which is a common feature of this fish because it's active during the night. So it's obviously looking for things really deep in the rock. So that was the second time that's pushed its head into something like that. So it must get the, the little crustaceans or fish inside. But it's very placid. We are, it is not 
bothered by us being here at all. Which is quite unusual, actually. So it's obviously just trying to find a place to rest and maybe as Pat mentioned it's putting its heads in holes and the little animals that are already living there are saying, hey, go away, find another place. So they do feed at night, that's what nocturnal does mean. The opposite of nocturnal is diurnal, which means during the day. But this fish is nocturnal and they love to feed on fishies. So they're carnivorous and they love to eat cardinal fish which is a group of fish we rarely mention actually on Dive Live. Yeah, we've only got seen cardinal fish on one occasion. They are very nocturnal and tend to hide away. They're very secretive. Yeah, John has mentioned something I was just going to say. So Pat explained where the name comes from, soap fish, because of this mucus that it produces. It's very soap-like. It's actually toxic. Oh, wow. Yeah, and John just uh, reminded us of that. Well, there you go. Thank you, John. This is fascinating, and I'm really enjoying watching this fish that we really never get to see. This is our first live sighting of this animal. Yeah, and it's really cool just to see it using, like, it, it's actually behaving in a different way, you know, it's sticking, it wants to, swimming around sticking its head in everything, it's obviously, yeah, on the hunt for either food or shelter, somewhere to relax. So just to give you some context, soapfish are actually part of the Serranidae family, which is sea basses. So sea basses, groupers and soapfish are all very closely related, and if you watch the way a grouper swims is actually quite similar to this soapfish when it's upright, not when it's on its side. And they're all related. There's about 150 species of sea bass worldwide. Yeah, and you can see, not so much by their body, but their head does look very bassy or groupery. They still have those really thick, robust jaws that you can tell really protrude out of the body there. I've got some questions for you, Pat. Jacqueline is asking, are there f any fish that tend to stay only in the shallows? Yes, there are. So quite often, juvenile fish will stay in the shallows because there's more protection and more safety from the bigger predators in close. Now that flounder that we saw earlier is also known to stay only, I've actually only ever seen it in the shallows. And also a lot of fish that eat gorgonians because there are quite a lot of sea fans here in the shallows. So you small butterfly fish and even the flamingo tongues that we saw earlier. And James is loving the fact that we're finding all these new fish, fish species. And we are too, we're really enjoying it. So we have another question from Richard, Pat. Are all of the reef fish here regional specific to the Caribbean? Or are there some species that can be found in other oceans? Sorry, can I please just get you to repeat that question? Sure. Are all of the reef fish here regional specific to the Caribbean or are some species found in other oceans? Oh, good question. Well, so the Caribbean Ocean is relatively closed off from the Atlantic, but there is a bit of crossover between the two regions. So a lot are specific to the Caribbean, but we do get a lot that are also native to the Atlantic Ocean. Just like with the with the tarpon, so they make a lot of planted. Uh, sorry, I'm just playing with this coordinate. Uh, because you know they are found in the Atlantic region. Yes, but a lot of the fish you do find in in many oceans throughout the world. So, for example, my favourite, this is just an example, the scribbled or scrawled filefish. It's the same fish, 
Aluterus scriptus, but you can find it in the Indian Ocean and you can also find it in the Atlantic Ocean. So yes, you can find say, the same species in different ocean basins, but as Pat mentioned, the Caribbean Sea is a little bit closed off. So not all of these species will sort of travel into different ocean basins. Obviously the lionfish is a great example of how a fish has travelled here and it's not meant to. But yeah, just on that, it's also fascinating to think that we, I don't get the exact same species, but we get very closely related species back in my home in temperate Australia where it's completely different weather, completely different conditions and there's not even really any corals but they still get things like snappers which are you know, very closely related to the red snapper for example is very closely related to the red snapper that we get here so even though I live in a region so far away and with completely different conditions there are still some linkages between these species, which is, yeah, incredible. It just shows how connected the ocean really is. So we did have a question from Proud Cat Mama. Do you know what the predators of the soap fish are? Now that's a tricky one because it does have that toxic mucus. Yeah, so I don't actually know. Usually I would just assume it is bigger fish like like sharks and droopers and barracudas. But yeah, when you throw into the account that they do have toxic mucus, I really do not know. Yeah, I would agree with Pat. It will be the much bigger fish that are the predators and they will have to be much bigger in order to sort of work their way through that toxic mucus. They must be able to process it as well, so the smaller fish will probably not be able to do that. And John has mentioned that mutton snapper are also worldwide, so yeah, perfect example that you can find them in many of the ocean basins. This soapfish really hasn't found a perfect hidey hole yet, has it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it really must be quite fussy about where it settles down. Now the only other soapfish I've seen here in Casuarina Point I found wedged right within a brain coral. So there was a little hollow section of the brain coral and it had wedged itself right in there. It didn't look comfortable but I guess these guys must really prefer a extremely tight kind of enclosed space. So Pat, can we have another air check? You've been diving for over an hour now. Yeah, wow. So, time is flying down here. I'm having a blast. So, I am on 90 bars. Alright, awesome. So it looks like this soap fish is getting a clean here. Can you see the goby there? Oh, we can now. So maybe that's what it was searching for. A clean after a night of hunting. So what we mean by being cleaned is that this little fish sees the, the, the parasites or the dead skin or any other unwanted nasty thing on the skin of this fish and it will just go along and pick it off because this benefits both the fish being clean by having all of these unwanted parasites off them and the fish doing the cleaning also gets a nice tasty meal and that has been brought to them like a fast food service. Yeah, we're getting such a great shot of this and all the cleaner fish swarming around. So those fish with the blue heads um, are actually the blue-headed wrasse. Now they are famous cleaners when they're young, but as they get older they don't tend to clean. So it is quite unusual to see them cleaning another animal. Yeah, that is right. And this blue-headed wrasse that's hanging around here 
I reckon, is the, the leader of his harem. Oh. So I say his because he is the dominant male. And we can tell that because it has a blue head. So blue headed rats usually are, well, the female form is yellow and black stripe. But when they metamorphosize into a male, they grow this dark blue head and look very different. And the, the male, the dominant male, will be in charge of the harem. The harem being all of the other females in the area, in his little territory. <laughs> and when he either dies or he moves on, or for some reason is excluded from this harem, then the next most dominant female will start to change colour and form and become the big dominant male. And sometimes you can see them in the intermediate phase between this transition, and they literally do look just like a mix between the two. Where, so we have the two here actually, the female and the male. So they will have those yellow and black stripes, but also develop the blue head. Yeah, isn't it incredible, the world of the wrasse. I think this is the first time we've been able to really focus on the blue head wrasse, actually. Yeah, we haven't actually blew them up that much. They are interesting little fish, though. But I'm still on the lookout for these squid. They do. We are in the prime squid spot, so usually when we are in this area, they are about. So we keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, I really hope you do find this squid. I just love them. Squid and octopus are just some of the most amazing creatures we have in the world. Never mind just the ocean. Yeah, they are really fascinating. Spend your whole life studying them and still be up in finding out new exciting information. So yes, the Jersey lady, it was the blue head wrasse. And you spelt rasp correctly. And Yambi Bike Mike would love to see a hawkfish. Mmm, I do love the hawkfish. Yeah, we don't tend to see them here in the shallows, but we are nearing the crest of the region now. And we do sometimes see them in the sandy channels. So hawkfish are small fish and they do tend to just rest on the bottom. So I'm sure Pat will be keeping his eye out for some hawkfish. But what we have in front of us now is sort of a big mixture of parrotfish, namely the striped parrotfish. Those ones with the white and black lines running down the body. Yeah, we can see the male here. It's quite a little, not too different from the female. We can definitely see the blue coloration as opposed to the black and white of the female. Now the parrotfish are part of the wrasse family. So when we talk about wrasse, that also includes the parrotfish. It's another really large grouping of fish that we have here on the reefs. So parrotfish, hogfish and razorfish and general wrasse are all grouped together. So, just looking in this area right now, there's so many different types of fish. I'm not sure which one to stop and talk about. There's too many to choose from. And there's a plethora of brown chromis and blue chromis hanging out here with some little rats. 
Oh, what is this? I have not seen this species before. It's a damselfish, but it's actually no. This is a yellow-tailed damselfish, but it's just a very different colour, and it's a lot bigger than the ones we usually see. Oh yeah, I can see it. And obviously, we don't need to explain where the name comes from. Of course, it comes from the fact that it has that bright yellow tail. We have a black bergen here. And I reckon it's used its spine to lock itself into position. I'll see if we can get the camera in there and show you. Its head was just sitting there very still. I'm not sure if you can still see that or not. Is it visible? Oh no, it's moved. But so these black dragons are trigger fish, so they have a little trigger on their head and they can actually use it to lock themselves into position. Yeah, here we go. Can you see that? Yeah, Pat, sorry for my absence. We have got a lot of thunder going on up the top. It does, there does seem to be a sort of storm rolling in. So I think for the, the safety of the two of you, it would be better to, to end the dive. It's been a wonderful long dive anyway. And we don't want lightning to come. So I think it would be better if you make your way back to the surface. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. As much as I was enjoying myself, it's always best to be safe. And as Lauren said, it's been a long dive and it's been a great dive. So I was really, really happy to bring you all along in this one, especially when we have so much new stuff. So thank you all for joining me. And I will be seeing you again, well, if the weather permits, at 11 a.m. Grand Cayman time. I'm excited for another awesome dive with you all. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, Dive Life family, for your continued support. Pat will be underwater again at 11 a.m. Grand Cayman time. See you then.